but we don't disturb I mean, uh, the proceedings. Uh, I would like to welcome you all. We really appreciate your presence, uh, the members of the media, our principals uh, here, uh, and also the colleagues uh, that are also here. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the program, uh, we'll be having uh, opening welcome and purpose of the briefing, which will be uh, done by the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Office of Health Standard Compliance, uh, Dr. Spriom Daweni. And then thereof, uh, we'll have a presentation of the report, uh, which will be uh, done by uh, the Health Ombud, Professor Malhapur Makova. And then from thereof, uh, we'll have uh, remarks uh, by the Minister of Health, uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Uh, Patla. And then from thereof, uh, immediately after that, uh, we'll afford I mean, uh, members of the media an opportunity to uh, also ask questions. And also those that uh, have joined us on the uh, visual platforms also will give you I mean, an opportunity also to uh, also ask those questions. Without wasting much time, uh, I'm going to hand over to the CEO, Dr. Mdawen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Program Director. And good morning to everyone gathered here. I wish to take this opportunity to extend warm greetings and welcome to all guests in attendance. Thank you each and every one of you for joining us this morning in this media briefing that is going to be led by Professor Mali Khapur Makhor. I wish to acknowledge and welcome in our midst the presence of our Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Joe Patla, as well as our Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Sbongisei Nidlomo. Indeed, I also wish to recognize their leadership in the healthcare sector. In our midst, we also welcome the MEC for Health and Houting, Ms. Nomantu Ngomo Ralihoko, accompanied by the HOD, acting HOD in Houting, Mr. Lisiba Malotana. We also have members that will be attending virtually, a member of the Houting Provincial Legislature, Mr. Jack Bloom, as well as uh, members of the Health Portfolio Committee in Parliament, that would be in virtual attendance. Let us also acknowledge and welcome the Deputy Director General of Corporate Services, Ms. Basani Baloyi. We also welcome the Deputy Director General of Public Entities, Governance and Management yes. in the Department of Health, Dr. Anben Bilay. We welcome the Deputy Director General of Hospitals, Tertiary Services and Human Resources in the Department of Health, Dr. Pesi Mahlati. Let me also welcome, and indeed it is my pleasure, to acknowledge the presence of our OHSC board chairperson, Dr. Ernest Genoshi, as well as an OHSC board member, Mr. Rajesh Mahebia. Indeed, a very warm welcome to the health ombud himself, Professor Makoba. Let me also at this stage recognize a team of colleagues, investigators, and senior managers that have worked with the health ombud, Ms. Marita Pomasemola, Ms. Joyce Monella, Mr. Douglas Mapeto, as led by the executive manager in the office of the health ombud, Dr. Donna Jacobs. If we do not lay ourselves in the service of mankind, then who shall we serve? As we serve others in our day-to-day -day activities, every act, every word, every gesture of genuine compassion naturally nourishes our own hearts. We gather once again in a quest to promote learning and a culture of improvement in our health services through the investigation and the resolution of complaints received by the Health Ombuds. The Office of Health Standards Compliance, an independent regulatory entity in the healthcare sector, is tasked with the responsibility as an encompassed in the National Health Act to promote and protect the health and safety 
of all those that use our health facilities in the country. Similarly, the Health Ombuds, as an independent body, is also tasked to consider, investigate, and dispose large complaints without any fear or favor in a fair, expeditious, and economical manner. High-quality health care and safety are regarded as core aspirations of any government and any healthcare service delivery system. Compliance with the norms and standards regulations through the Office of Health Standard Compliance, as well as the disposal of the investigations and complaints lodged through the Health Ombuds, together should contribute in the provision of quality health care, which then defines the existence of both offices. The purpose of this media briefing is to provide an opportunity and a platform to our health ombud to release the findings of an investigation conducted on allegations against Rahima Musa, Mother and Child Hospital. The complaint came through various channels, through members of parliament, and also was covered widely in the media. Professor Makoba will take us through the report, giving us the details of the investigations that was conducted, the information that was gathered, and the recommendations that we arrived at. We then, as the Office of Health Standard Compliance, have a responsibility to monitor implementation of these recommendations, all aimed at ascertaining that there is improvement in the services that we provide in our health facilities. Let us remember that in the healthcare sector, our patients and all those that visit our health facilities, both in the public and private sector, are our customers. Now, customers don't expect us to be perfect. However, they do expect us to fix things when they go wrong. The commitment of the Office of Health Standard Compliance and the Health Ombud is to promote a just and learning culture that is transparent, open, and accountable when mistakes occur. Therefore, the release of this report should be viewed as an opportunity to develop and improve the provision of health services and should be recognized as a positive way that would contribute towards improving our services. Most importantly, we need to identify the lessons learned and promote accountability. Amidst the challenges that we face in the healthcare sector and that we experience, some of which are known to most of us here, let me acknowledge all the healthcare workers and all the personnel in our health institutions who remain the soldiers who toil through the days and nights in the service to the sick, in the service to the injured, in the service of those that are called to a higher place. Honorable Minister, ladies and gentlemen, allow me and jointly kindly as I invite the Health Ombud of South Africa, Professor Malika Brumakoro Makoba, who actually requires no introduction, who's going to take us through the report. Professor Makoba, it is my honor to invite you to share and release the report, which will then be received by the Office of Health Standard Compliance. Over to you, Prof. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Spiwe. Uh, Ricardo, who is the program director, the Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, the MEC, and the Chair of the Board of the OHSC, and the Board Member of the OHSC, Mr. Mahabir, and all of you that are gathered here to come and, uh, and receive this report which is by law something that I have to do every time I have prepared a report. Firstly, I have to acknowledge the people who did this work uh, that are called investigators, uh, headed by Dr. Donna Jacobs. Uh, the people who really were on the ground, it was Marita Masemula and uh, Douglas uh, Mapeto and uh, Joyce Munera. They were on the field, on, on the ground, 
to do the hard work. And as it happens in most of these things, uh, the hard workers never appear in front of televisions. Uh, only the people who take the credit, like myself, do appear. Uh, as you, most of you would realize, yesterday, I think it was the days of the Oscar, uh, obviously uh, actors wait for the Oscars uh, to be shown. And I guess for the health ombud, releasing a report is like uh, coming to the Oscars. It is my Oscar day. It just happens to be a day after the real Oscars. But I was also informed that, uh, like American football, we have to present this uh, uh, report in front of the media and therefore our time is determined by the media rather than by ourselves. We have joined, I think, the, the modern age. I'm going to, to take you through this report uh, like I'm telling a story because when we booked this uh, venue, we thought that we would have a, a place where we could show a movie. And then only on Friday we were told, no, you, you've got a small hall, you can't show any slide. And I even thought maybe I should have booked a, a hall in Maravastad uh, where I can go and show a proper movie and there would be nice sounds, but uh, I wasn't allowed to do that. Be that as it may, um, my team has spent a better part of a year investigating complaints at, uh, at Rahima Musa. And I'm going to, to start this by uh, telling you the conclusions and then work backwards. Uh, remember that uh, at one time in my life, I used to be a doctor. And as doctors, we make diagnosis. And then we can, you can sleep, play with your cell phones, but you'll have had the message. So what is the conclusion? In 2016, an investigation was taken, uh, was undertaken at Rahima Musa Hospital by Professor Kuvadia and Professor Lombard. They have been working there for a very long time and they are academic at, uh, academics at uh, Rahima Musa. And they came to the conclusion <coughs> in three words having investigated what was happening at Rahima Musa, that the hospital was unsafe. That, that's the words they use, an unsafe hospital. During our investigations, we interviewed just around 34 people across the hospital, 34 in all. And there were words that became common that we had as we were interviewing these people. Three ways also came up. Dirty, filthy, and unsafe. So those were the ways that were used by the people we interviewed. And these are common ways that we picked up, I think, as investigators with, with my team. Now, one has to look at this in the background that Rahima Musa, had won the Kanyisa Award some years ago. In fact, I was telling some people that when we were medical students and you wanted to train in one of the best hospitals in the country, you wanted to go to Coronation Hospital. Uh, for those that may not know, my mother-in-law actually did her nursing training at uh, Rahima Musa. That must be many years ago, but it tells you the sort of place it used to be. Now, when you hear these words, you get worried. So, during the investigation into the allegations against the hospital, the most striking thing has been the fact that this hospital has been neglected over years. Uh, and also, because it's an old hospital, it has a, a group of people that have worked there for a long time and for some reason or another they think they own the hospital but that's that's that normally happens with human beings you work there for a long you think you think you are the hospital uh, most of you remember the late winnie mandela she used to say she's the anc 
because he had been in the movement for a long time, but that was just uh, those are just expressions of people. And and some of these people obviously have got behaviors that obviously we are making some recommend recommendations about later on. There are two people actually who provided very seminal uh, uh, pieces of evidence. It was Dr. Meyer. I'm sure you heard about him in the media. He actually presented, gave us his uh, his. Uh, articles that he wrote, uh, that he complained about, and there was a, a member of Gayton McKenzie party called Mr. Saul, who when he heard about this issue, he went to the hospital and actually did a video so that uh, there is actually visual evidence of what was happening uh, at, at night at uh, Rahima Musa and confirmed almost all the complaints that I'm going to tell you about. So there was evidence that you couldn't dispute. Uh, as, as I said, there was incontrovertible evidence to support some of the allegations that were made by uh, the honorable member. Now, obviously, I know Novandu is here. She is the new MEC and she's trying her best. But she has inherited a mess and uh, I'm not saying this for the first time I think she has inherited a mess and I say this because in my life as an ombud I did an investigation on life as a domain in 2016 uh, I did an investigation in Tembisa hospital in around 2021-2022 uh, I have now done an investigation in Rahim Musa. Uh, and my, my colleagues in the investigation team have done other investigations in other hospitals. And the pattern that we're seeing is very similar. Now, it becomes significant for the following reasons. Uh, most of you may not realize that I think somewhere in the 90s, the UN identified that health and education were the primary drivers for a vibrant a society or democracy and, and a vibrant economy. So you can do many things if you have a population that is uneducated, uh, obviously it will become unhealthy or it won't understand I think the importance of health and if you have a, a healthy population, it obviously gets to know what to do. And you have a, a, a lively economy and you have a vibrant democracy. So Gauteng, the Gauteng province is the smallest, I think, geographically. But it contributes 33% of the GDP of the country. So if ever you needed a uh, a section or a sector of South African society that needed to function and be up there as an example, the Gauteng province is the province. Uh, you have a concentration of media in Gauteng, concentration of gossipers in Gauteng, you have everything, you know. Uh, uh, the economy is located, the, everybody wants, to, they leave the Eastern Cape, they live in Popo, they all want to be where? in Gauteng. They can even sleep under the bridges here, but when they go home, they tell you, hey, I work in Gauteng. I mean, we all have seen that. We've had cousins doing that. So this province is very important, I think, in the DNA of South Africa. And therefore, I think it's functioning and it's well-being. It's very important. That's why I think it's a, it's a, it's a good example, I think, to, to investigate. So, what was the complaint that was brought to, to our office? This complaint was lodged on the 6th of April, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in 2022. Most of you remember the 6th of April is Van Riebeck's day. Mm -hmm. uh, others will remember it as the day on which uh, Solomon Mashangu, I think, was hanged. So, it has uh, different meanings, but it's an important date. I don't know why uh, the the honorable member from the health portfolio brought it on that day. She had three complaints that she brought to the office. That expectant mothers at Rahima Musa Hospital slept on the floor. 
The second complaint was that the hospital chief executive officer uh, was not working full time at the hospital to ensure that everything ran smoothly. Since she had been appointed in 2021 January, she had only spent 182 days uh, at that hospital. This complaint was raised by Mr. Jack Bloom of the DA in the legislature, and it was confirmed by the previous MEC as uh, being uh, uh, accurate. And that they held the dignity of, uh, of, of our patients in that hospital was really not being taken care of. As you know, one of the principles of our constitution is dignity and respect. You have to respect people, you have to respect patients, and this was the major complaint. So what did we do? Um, as I've already indicated, we had uh, a group of us going there on, si on site visits. We had personal interviews. We had audio recordings. We had transcriptions that we had to do. We reviewed the literature. We analyzed uh, all the documents that we could find. We took pictures. And I thought I was going to show you a movie of the hospital uh, sh to show you how you know, pipes have broken there, sewage is seeping all over the place, paint is falling apart, but uh, unfortunately, GSESI decided otherwise that maybe you don't deserve to see that before lunch, maybe for, for other reasons. So, as I said, we, between uh, August uh, to November last year, we interviewed uh, 34 people. We, provide, we produced a provisional report um, in December we send it to all the people that are implicated as, as it's required by law. We ask them to respond uh, and they all responded. Uh, and then we looked at their responses against the ev evidence that we had gathered. And uh, we had to then write the final report, uh, taking that into consideration. And all their responses are captured in the report as they are so that we are all transparent, not necessarily naked, but transparent. So that's what we have done. So the report that you are receiving, it's really a, a history of what we did and what we have found. What we did find is that the, most of the responses that we received, I think from uh, all the people that were implicated, actually afforded us the chance to strengthen the findings that we had made and and that was quite useful so what did we find we found that actually it was true that patients uh, pregnant mothers slept on the floor there was a video that was actually given to us by mr Saul, but also almost all the the people that we interviewed confirmed that that was the case so we couldn't, we couldn't obviously ignore that. Then there was the confirmation that obviously the CEO did not spend as much time as he was supposed to uh, at the hospital. And I've given you the number of dates, it was 182. And uh, uh, what had happened was that she had provided that information to the previous MEC. So it was her information that actually documented uh, the days that she had not been in hospital. But our team obviously did further investigations to go to the HR to look for how leave is, uh, you know, is, is appropriated or given in the department. And we did find that, you know, uh, in 2021, there were a shortfall of 27 days that we couldn't account for from just doing our own calculations. And in 22, uh, 2022, it was 72 days of, uh, of, uh, of this that could not be accounted for. And all that is in the report. And clearly the allegation that uh, you know, the dignity of the patient was not being respected becomes really obvious. If you have a pregnant woman sleeping on the floor, you obviously take dignity. If you have uh, 
a pregnant ladies that are in a hospital that is unsafe where the toilets are not functioning the heating system cannot function because of the breakages of the system that cannot be a dignified environment to find yourself in so that was also confirmed i think uh, by our walkabout and and as i say we've taken lots of pictures that you will find i think in the report when you do look at it because the annexures are actually three times bigger than the report itself just for those people that are visually uh, excited i think you will find it uh, quite interesting to to go through the document we then f f had other additional findings we find that there were several lapses uh, in the appointment of CEOs in Houting. What do I mean by that? Uh, I'll give an example. When you are a vice chancellor, there are certain positions you can fiddle around. And in the university, these are the, the professoriate. You want those in the description of those people that go to bad horses to be the thoroughbreds of your institution. You can't, uh, you can't fiddle around and think, oh, should he be a professor or should he not? It's either they are a professor or they are not. And once you start to have doubts, and there's no benefit of doubt that you give to a professor. You do it the other way around. There should be no doubt at all. Now, the CEOs of hospitals are really the highest level in the hospital services that determine the direction around which the quality service is provided, but also they feed into the minister and the MECs. The MECs depend for their own interpretation of what's happening in the health service by the CEOs. So the criteria for selecting CEOs has to be absolutely, you know, unquestionable. And what we did find was that in Gauteng, unlike in other provinces, they have lowered the criteria for appointing CEOs. Now, you can say, you're all, I can hear some people muttering. So how else can you read this? Think about it. We have nine provinces in our country. In only one province have CEOs been suspended. Which province is that? Houting. Calafon, two at uh, Tembisa, and, uh, and obviously, you know, several others. You go to KZN, you don't find that. You go to the Western Cape, you don't find that. You go to my home province, Limpopo, you don't find that. Uh, so there is something that you could pick up that in Houting, the supposedly well-resourced province, the top province, has a problem of, uh, of choosing CEOs. What was even worse was that when we looked at the choices of the CEOs, the, the selection committee and uh, the employer didn't seem to read what the referee's report have said, the competency test have said. They just seemed to ignore that to choose somebody, uh, you know, there is a language in South Africa that you can use that I'm not going to use here uh, so that I don't go to jail. So there is a problem of human resources, the quality of the people that we choose to lead our hospital and in Houting it seems to be worse than in other provinces. Uh, I've already spoken about the infrastructure uh, of the hospital. Uh, as I say, a study had been done in 2016. I think we were just reconfirming that, that uh, the sewage system is not working, the heating system is not working, the toilets are not working, and uh, there are pictures to show that. Here is something that uh, really worried me. You have a specialized hospital, which Fahima Musa is. It's highly specialized. It looks after mothers and babies, and obviously, it is a high risk, highly specialized uh, hospital. It has no laboratory service. It has got no blood bank. And anybody who has been in an obstetric ward knows that, you know, blood is almost the life 
lifeblood of obstetric practice. Operations are the lifeblood of obstetric and neonates are, you know, those are the sort of things that you can't run such a hospital without a 24-hour laboratory service. Rahima Musa doesn't have that in the 21st century. If you said that to people, uh, maybe we should tell the Minister of Home Affairs to tell all these people who come to our country that we don't, we have such hospitals, they may not come. But uh, that's a topic for another time. So they don't have that. Uh, CAT scan, they have got one CAT scan that doesn't seem to function, but uh, apparently it's been sorted out. They didn't have a hospital board, but uh, I think they are trying to sort that out. I think Normandy is doing that. And then they've got security challenges. Hospital staff has been marked in the campus. Cars have been stolen there. And the securities don't seem to have the equipment to perform jobs as security. You know, when I was a, when I was a young doctor, uh, I worked in a hospital where the security were so obese that they could never catch you if you ran away. <laughs> so, you know, you, you employ these people to, to become security, but you know that they can't do their job. But nevertheless, it's fine. So I think there is a challenge of security and I think uh, it will be sorted out. There's a shortage of nursing staff <coughs> and uh, the famous supply chain management is all over. And you know when there are problems of supply management, it's, it's, a, it's another word for corruption. But uh, we didn't go into that because it's not our thing. So we know that uh, Rahima Musa obviously has got a catchment area and a study was done that over the past three years it gets about 40% of his patients are not South African citizens. But that's a, a topic that obviously it excites South Africans. But 40% of the patients that go to Rahima Musa are not South African citizens. And because of the overcrowding uh, the filthy environment. This is obviously a fertile ground for nosocomial infections. And for those of you who know, neonates are the most vulnerable to such infections because their immune system is not well developed and so forth. And to crown you all, there is no intensive care in a modern specialized hospital such as Rahima Musa. So, what did we think it was worth recommending? The first recommendation, which I think uh, the province had already taken, I think, steps which, for which we compliment them, was that uh, we felt that Re Rahima Musa deserved to have a new CEO. And that CEO must be fit for purpose. And I think I have had some discussions with both the Premier of the province and the MEC with regards to this, I think, and they understand that uh, that clearly, and I think they, are, they themselves are, are concerned. In the report, we have spelled out what we think are the minimum criteria to have a CEO run a hospital uh, of the nature and of the size of, uh, of Rahima Musa. So we are recommending that there be a new CEO appointed, the criteria be defined properly, and the selection processes and the reports of that must be unambiguous that this is for a CEO and not be fudged because I think it will be discovered again. The second uh, recommendation we made was that uh, the, the, the former CEO who has, who the department has already taken away from the hospital should really uh, be removed from this environment where she is and the province has already done that they have taken her to to the head office that's where she works and in interviewing her it became clear in her own way repeatedly that this was the most stressful job she had ever done and uh, she, she had obviously problem in handling stress, but uh, she seems to be coping well where she is at the moment uh, from the few conversations I've had with her.
But in addition to that, uh, this investigation went beyond the hospital. Uh, we then contacted the HPCSA and discovered that obviously she does have uh, engagements with the HPCSA, SPCSA and they were trying to, I think they were trying to stabilize her uh, for the condition that she has. And uh, in our conversation and discussion, I think uh, with the people in the province, I think it was agreed that uh, she should commit herself to this stabilization when she is at the head office so that she can, she can be supported uh, and be stabilized and then be assessed, I think, for what uh, future role she can play, but not to be, I think, in an environment that is as stressful as she was exposed to at Rahima Musa Hospital. And we have supported that. Uh, I will be in touch with the, with the Health Professional Council to find a way in which I think the, the previous uh, CEO can be supported. Uh, the next recommendation we made was that I think the hospital should be prioritized for infrastructure. I think uh, the Premier confirmed that with the MEC and uh, be dealt with, I think, properly. And they should uh, ensure that the hospital is gazetted as a tertiary hospital because that's the function it does. But I think the way it's classified, it's something is, is quite different. I've already spoken about really the leadership issues at uh, Rahima Musa that they do need to appoint, I think, people in leadership that are competent at almost all levels. I mean, the HR system there uh, is it's not, uh, I think, comp you know, uh, consistent with the level at which the hospital is functioning. Uh, and also, I think we have recommended that they should go back to the, the 2016 report and look at it when they are doing these uh, uh, recommendations and, and, and sort it out. They should look at their staff establishment, particularly their nursing establishment, and they, sh they should try and establish an ICU. Otherwise, otherwise we have <laughs> a hospital in the heart of South Africa that functions, I don't know, uh, like what. You know, uh, I come from a small town. Uh, we have a small hospital called Jane Fest, which has got most of these things that I'm talking about. Now I come to Jobe, and I think I'm being promoted. I'm going to be in Josie. Then I go to a hospital that has got no ICU, there's no laboratory. I mean, what have I done? You know, it's a demotion. For, but but we are still crazy about Jobe. Anyway. And then we have recommended uh, really two disciplinary inquiries. One must be, we felt that the, the current CEO should really be taken to account to deal with the way in which she dealt with her leave uh, arrangements. I mean, that's for the, for, the, for the disciplinary inquiry to decide how to handle that. But we felt that this is actually an administrative issue that should be dealt with that way. It cannot be dealt with, you know, we cannot find a political solution like uh, sometimes we do in South Africa. There's none here. You have to deal with it administratively. And then there is a there's a lady called Kuduka who was in charge of the of the theaters. The hospital ran short of uh, 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 the me medication that is used to prepare for abdominal surgery, and she decided to go and create her own concoction. That was used, I think, uh, to to clean uh, people for abdominal surgery, and I think that led to about eleven infections that had to be taken back to theatre. But again, that's something that uh, the the hospital needs to deal with. So, you know, you're working in a hospital where everything gets tested mm -hmm. and uh, there are criteria, and then you just go and make your own medicine and and give it to people without them knowing that this is not the right thing so we just felt that uh, that's uh, yeah and then at the end of this report we have listed all the norms and standards that have been breached in this hospital as i say we have shared this re report with the premier and the mec and we are sharing it with you today but that's all that i have to say about uh, 
uh, this uh, investigation. And again, I'm grateful to the people who did this. It took us almost a year minus 23 days to finish this investigation. That's how long it took us. But uh, we think we have identified the issues and uh, the issues are quite specific, but they are also general in nature. And I think uh, the new team in Houting have got their job cut out into the future. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, uh, for uh, the presentation of the report. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm now going to call uh, to the podium the Honorable Minister of Health uh, to give us uh, the remarks uh, in relation to the presentation that was done by the health board. Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, let me firstly uh, say good morning to Professor Mahoba, uh, our health ombud, and thank him for a uh, job well done. Uh, as my regards to my colleague, uh, Deputy Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Lomo, the MEC, uh, the Chair of the Office of the Health Standard and uh, the, a board member who's also accompanying him <coughs> and uh, the CEO uh, who also uh, started these proceedings and, and, and everybody else who's here from both Houting and the National Health Department. Uh, again, we're very thankful to the job well done by the Health Ombud as always, uh, telling it as it is. Um, um, indeed, uh, that is what uh, the law which established the Health Ombud Office has actually said, uh, in that the investigations of any complaint must be done in good faith, uh, without fear, without favor, without bias, and without any prejudice. The purpose of this being <coughs> to pro protect and promote the health and safety of users of the of our health services um, now this applies to health service i, I know that overall as uh, prof mahova has indicated uh, a few other reports which he has done it's mainly been in the public service but in terms of the the law uh, let me just remind citizens that even complaints regarding private health services should also be submitted to the Office of the Health Ombud. Uh, I think that's something which uh, we need to just check over the last five years uh, or, or more whether uh, that has been happening. We know that 85% um, or more of South Africans depend on the public health system. Uh, that's the system which carries the burden under a lot of pressure. And that's why most of the complaints will come from the public health uh, system. But uh, just to remind South Africans that they must not be shy of reporting also uh, deficiencies which they come across also in the private health services. Indeed, it's a very sobering report, a very sobering report uh, which lays bare uh, a lot of shortcomings within uh, our health system, as I agree with uh, uh, Prof. Mahova, that um, while this is about uh, Rahiba Musa uh, Mother and Child Hospital, uh, we're quite aware that a number of other facilities uh, in our public health system suffers equal deficiencies. Uh, so uh, that's what we need to be looking at. Uh, but very specifically for this morning, we're uh, talking about the Rah Rahiba Musa mother and child hospital uh, as he has uh, indicated a very iconic hospital with a lot of history uh, in, it, in its own right in terms of the role it has played over many years 
but also Prof. and MBC and the Deputy Minister and colleagues, uh, I think we also owe it to uh, the very good gesture which uh, Houghton government did many years ago, naming some of these hospitals after our heroes and heroines. Uh, Comrade Rahima Musa was one of the leaders uh, of the Women's March of 9th August 1956 across here uh, where I was earlier this morning at the Union Building. Uh, so those are our heroines. Equally so, we talk about Helen Joseph, uh, Charlotte Matlake, very good gesture. Uh, equally, as we said the other time when you're talking, let me see about the Tambo Memorial, that, uh, we, you know, we also must recognize the burden of responsibility when we do these good gestures of recognizing our heroes. We can't put their names and then not look after those institutions and make sure that they live up to, you know, what those leaders, uh, their standards of service to the people uh, demand of us. So, so that's the responsibility which uh, uh, MBC, uh, Houghton and ourselves have to take from the report of the, of the health ombuds. Um, we appreciate uh, all the matters which the report is pointing out about the plight of uh, very vulnerable, you know, mothers, pregnant women who come to the hospital and give birth and uh, before they can go through, you know, th this very important process of uh, uh, producing new life. They have to go through harrowing experiences of sitting on chairs and also sleeping on the floor. Um, and, and that says a lot about the pressure on, on the institution. Um, we know that uh, that pressure, as, as the report also indicates, uh, it's both in terms of just the growth of the population uh, and with no uh, simultaneous growth in our capacity to look after uh, the people, but uh, also internal migration, I mean, Houghton, uh, I think over a 10 year period as a population, just in terms of those resident in Houghton, has increased from uh, in, in 10 years period from around 9 million to currently about 16 million people. So, uh, so that's a very significant growth. But as the report indicates, over and above that, you also have uh, also uh, non-South Africans who also come specifically for maternity services. Uh, we know that uh, in this province, uh, across while there are demands for other services across the board uh, for South Africans and also uh, non-South Africans, uh, some some of them not even documented. Um, uh, but um, we we know that uh, that 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 pressure is is huge, and, and uh, some of those simply come for the maternity services. It's the most pressurized service uh, across all the all the hospitals in Gauteng. But um, but over and above the, the capacity, it's also as the report indicates, just uh, lack of maintenance uh, of, of various key facilities, as already uh, uh, mentioned. Very basic. Some of those very basic. I mean, if your ablution facilities are, just, are not maintained. Uh, it's just the risk is huge. Uh, the risk is huge. So, um, for us, what we want to commit uh, uh, to to the team, uh, uh, the, the Professor Makoma and his team, uh, for the very you know uh, uh, you know uh, good work which has been done, we want to commit to work together with the province to expedite the remedial action which is required. Um, one in terms of the infrastructure which must be attended to um, but also in terms of the, um, the man management capacity which which is quite key uh, because uh, the, the report highlights deficiencies uh, in in management because um, we also are aware of uh, MSC of the fact that uh, some of these area areas it's not purely the issue of money. Uh, it's also just uh, management deficiencies. 
Um, I mean, not long ago, I, I went to one of the other hospitals where I asked one of our senior managers to, to go and just help. And then when she came back, and there was also these issues of, you know, uh, just not uh, lack of cleaning, uh, basic maintenance and, and cleaning. And then when she came back, she said, you know, Minister, I found, I met a number of, I think there were about 15 uh, artisans who were actually idling in the hospital. Some of them said they were plumbers, some said they were electricians. And I asked, but you can't, the, the, so many toilets are blocked uh, and you've got plumbers, electricians. And then they said, uh, uh, one was that although they are based in the hospital, they report to another department. Uh, and so they are waiting for instructions. I mean, imagine a plumber who's paid a salary and is there from 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, hopefully staying until 4, even though you don't know what they're doing. But he's waiting for instructions to go and unblock a toilet because uh, somebody has not said, go and unblock this toilet. And these are people on, on, on salaries. And it was only after, she said, you know, after a bit of pep talk and, and encouragement, uh, uh, some work was done. So the issue which the report highlights of the CO is just a, the CO is just a representation of the, the, the lapses of management which we must deal with. Uh, but of course if you don't have a leader in the form of a CEO then uh, very little is going to, to go right and I'm happy that uh, that matter uh, you know there's a beginning of, of dealing with that. So um, as I conclude uh, I want to pledge to um, to the ombud and, and his team and to the uh, residents of, of Houting and others utilizing this particular facility and as we say it is a microcosm of other challenges with other facilities we are determined uh, working together we do have uh, programs through which we you know uh, look at all these facilities uh, to try and make sure that uh, there can be improvement. We have said to ourselves that, uh, of course, over, over just over two years, we are derailed by uh, the pandemic where there was too much focus in terms of uh, financial resources, infrastructure, human resources, just focusing on the pandemic. And we shouldn't make excuse about that, that, that but that was also a diversion. Uh, we, had, we were happy that that part is now settled in the sense that the stability we're not getting any uh, serious challenges in that regard so i've said to uh, team uh, of within the national department when we have our meetings that uh, 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 you know together with uh, dr lomo that uh, colleagues there is no more excuse about COVID. COVID. Uh, while we say it's still in our midst, we still need to vaccinate and protect ourselves. We can't use it as an excuse why this and that has not been done. So, uh, and as I conclude, uh, maybe just a digression to say uh, this morning, I'm also happy, Prof, and, and all the people here that I believe, I think over the last seven days uh, with the, all the MECs, we could also use the strike as an excuse but uh, thanks to the assistance of uh, the judiciary in, in helping us to execute our responsibilities as of you know this week uh, going forward um, i'm informed that uh, things are returning to normality so uh, from tomorrow onwards uh, mc uh, and, and deputy minister and all our managers in all provinces it's over now to use the strike as an excuse for not performing in the same way as we can no more use COVID. So as we address the problems of uh, Rahima Musta, mother and child, let us also commit totally uh, to making sure that with them, uh, the resources at our disposal, as inadequate as they may be, we must do our best in making sure that we can uh, improve, continuously improve the quality of services, especially in the public service. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister, for those I mean, uh, remarks. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm now going to uh, 
hand over the report to the ombud, who will in turn uh, also hand over to the CEO. I'm supposed to hand over a hard copy of this to the minister. Uh, I'm sure all of you will get copies uh, as, a, as a present for blessing us today. But the minister has to get the first one. As you can see, the annexes are bigger than the report. And the of the board and the MEC and the deputy MEC. Yeah. Uh, colleagues, uh, we are now uh, going to allow uh, members of the media an opportunity to uh, pose I mean, questions. Uh, those are present here and also those that are on the uh, visual I mean, uh, platforms uh, to also ask questions if they have. Uh, colleagues, uh, the floor is officially opened. For questions, I've noted uh, you. I've not uh, in that sequence. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, let's take those first. And four. Yeah, four. That's it. Yeah. You first. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is. Uh, I just have two questions for the health minister and the housing health agency. So firstly, um, will you be playing any supervisory role to ensure that the hospital uh, implements uh, these recommendations? And then secondly, um, until when does uh, Rahima Musa, Madam Child Hospital have to appoint a new CEO? So what timeline will be um, implemented to appoint? Thank you, Paul. The Hello, Sylvia uh, Ramasigam with the ENCA. Um, I'd like to start with the issue of accountability. I don't see anything in the report with regards to who's going to be held accountable uh, for the lack of implementation from the first report in 2017 to now, and whether there's anybody who can be criminally liable um, for the issues at the hospital. Because the report also mentions issues about a lack of infrastructure, maintenance and development at the hospital. And I'm pretty sure the hospital has a budget that is allocated to get upgrades, for example. Um, secondly, in terms of the timeline on the turnaround for the hospital, 
Do we have any set timelines on those? I don't want to see it on a particular two months, but when it comes to infrastructure um, and other high human and security issues, well, what are the time frames there? And I'm hoping that you'll stick around because I have more questions around how to help the public in general. Okay, no, thank you. But we'll give you a chance. Uh, yeah. The third one. We need to have to have a health in the service. I just wanted to ask Professor Marco, please give us more details about what he means when he talks about the supply chain problems that indicate corruption. And I also wanted to just check in whether the picture that you referred to is available for the media. Thank you. Thank you. The last round. Thanks. It's called on what you said from Ivory Coast News. I wanted to find out, just clarity please on the days that were unaccounted for for um, the CEO. I heard, I think it was 27, and then I heard 71. Is 71 the, um, the full number of days that were unaccounted for? And then I know that the um, Ombud said you had a, a, some sort of an engagement with her. Where did she say she was for these 71 days um, that she clearly didn't report to work for? And then you speak about stabilizing her uh, on it. Um, uh, can you just clarify what that means? So you say you're going to be stabilizing her, providing her some sort of support. What does the stabilization for her mean? Um, and then during this time that she's at the health department, will she continue to get a salary during this time? And then just um, in terms of the timelines, what are the timelines for her DC um, particularly? When will she come to this DC and yeah, think about the timeline? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those. Uh, yeah, you can go. Yes. Thank you. It's Marima Muta from SABC TV News. Uh, still on the CEO, my question is uh, whether she did at any point uh, report at the strenuous conditions uh, under which she was working and to who and as to also um, who was holding the fort in her absence okay now thank you uh, I'm now going to allow uh, uh, the panel here to respond to the questions uh, profile and over to you first so that you can address those and then will be followed by uh, first of all, uh, I did say that uh, there were 27 days that were calculated in 2021 and there were 71 days that were calculated in 2022. So they are not at the same span uh, that the calculations was made. And these calculations were made through records in the HR department and, uh, and other pieces of information. But more importantly is that uh, obviously we needed explanation. Let me give you an example. If somebody says, I didn't come to work because I was on a Zoom meeting. Now when you go on to a Zoom meeting, it's recorded that you are on a Zoom. You log in and it will pick you up. Uh, or if you are not able to explain as to where you were, I think that cannot be justifiable as a day on which you worked. And, and sometimes you, you, you say you are at work and then people see you in a function. So these are things that become inconsistent. And I think that's how we came to the conclusion that some of the days were the way they were. And as I say, she has been provided with this information so she has seen it. It's not like a, it's a secret or anything like that. But importantly, I think the first uh, dates that were recorded, uh, that were presented to the legislature, that information was from her, that those were the days. And, uh, and obviously, we could only accept that if the person says that I wasn't there for those days and, uh, and so forth. So I think that is, that is the first thing. The second one is, I think in, in all these recommendations, we have tried to put the time frames. Uh, in, in, in most of them, if not all. Uh, remember that uh, the role of the ombud is not to be punitive uh, because we don't have that power. 
what we are supposed to do is to make findings and recommendations. That is our role. Now, we have made recommendations that somebody must be disciplined. The province may decide we don't want to discipline them and we're not going to be chasing them all over town why they didn't discipline a person. They must have a rationale for that. So I think uh, just understand where the limits of our, our powers are. Uh, you know, you can't be a referee player, goalkeeper and, and a scorer. So our powers have been you know, delineated in a particular way. Our role is to make findings, recommendations against the norms and standards that have been prescribed by the minister. That's why I've listed the norms and standards that have been breached in these uh, investigations as, as a two pages of them in your, in, your, in your report. Those that wanted to see the slides Actually, the annexures contain all the slides that you want to see uh, in relation to the infrastructure that you want to see that happened at the hospital. The, the issue of, uh, of uh, the CEO, what do I mean when I say uh, she requires support? First of all, uh, the, the CEO uh, has a condition uh, that she, you know, she obviously did release to us as to what the conditions was. Uh, and when we were uh, inquiring and investigating in relation to the HPCSA, we also confirmed that she had actually also notified the HPCSA and they had decided that she requires some specialized treatment that she needs to undergo and all I needed to confirm from her was whether she's committed to that. Because if she was not committed to that, then there are consequences for that. If you're not committed and the HPCSA wants to help you in your professional sense. So all of these things we have gone through. And the, the ultimate aim, as uh, somebody said, uh, my role as an ombud is to investigate and find solutions in an amicable way and not i'm not in the business of destroying people's careers i'm in the business of ensuring that people are accountable they are supported where it is necessary to be supported and uh, i felt that that support was required both from the province remember the province has a contract with her they have decided she can't be the CEO, but they want to see her at the headquarters. Now, what must she do when she's there for the next three years of her contract? She must be supported and be allowed to undergo training in whatever way that the, the province deems fit. And the HPCSA at the same time will be assessing her status of stress management or whatever it is so that uh, she can become a complete human being at the end of it all now what happens at the end of her contract is something that obviously both the hpcsa and the the employer must come to decide and obviously they will talk to her that they uh, were going to assess you and this is how we feel things should be but uh, i'm not I'm not given the power to terminate people's contracts. Are there any questions that I didn't answer? Slindel, I think you had some question that I, maybe I missed. Uh, there was a question around accountability. Well, uh, that is not a, a, a domain of my speciality in life, but in general, if you were to to take a drive to many hospitals in our country, I'm sure you would find many people that are criminally liable because most of them have never seen a paint since when they were built. So I don't think that the idea here was to, to find criminality. It was to identify what the problems are and how they can be corrected. You did ask about the issue of accountability. Obviously, the accountable authority 
uh, at the moment will be the MEC and maybe the Premier and their team in Gauteng to say we have this problem that we're seeing in our province, how do we solve it? I think in some way they've indicated that they prioritize the hospital, they want it to be done. And, and remember that there are many other people who have worked in this position before the current CEO. She's only been there for two years, and we're talking about something that has been there for, for a long time. So I don't know how you can, um, even with the best legal brains, I don't think uh, you, know, you can find criminal liability in such a situation. The hospital is just dilapidated and it needs to be fixed. And I'm not sure how you identify those that may be criminally liable. Uh, you know, in South Africa, unfortunately, when people can't account for themselves, the only person who gets uh, blamed for everything is the minister. So I think <laughs> we must be also be careful. I, is he criminally liable? I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, yeah, but the MEC, the Premier, and obviously the the CEO of uh, OHSC are the people that are supposed to take this matter forward. My function, I, I behave like a bee. I only sting and I die afterwards. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, <coughs> colleagues, um, we are going to afford um, in the MEC to also respond to some of the questions. I think maybe yours also, also will be covered by the MEC. Yeah, over to you, man. Thank you. Thank you. For, uh, let me greet the minister, the deputy minister, the chair of the board, the chair of the ombudsman, and all the people that are here that have been acknowledged earlier on when we arrived. Um, I think, uh, Chair, I'm not going to... The Minister is going to come and summarize some of the issues that we are raising. But one, what I wanted to indicate is that the recommendations that um, uh, Dr. Makoba is raising, some of them already were implementing them. When I started four months ago, I visited all the hospitals. I picked up these issues that are raised in the report, including at Raima Musa. In fact, I know all of them now, even if I'm sleeping, I can count what is it, what's happening in the hospital. Then we came up in the office, we made a plan of how can we deal with those problems, being it financial problems, issues that are related to clinical services, and, and the ones that the infrastructure one, which were the major one. And we, we agreed that instead of pointing fingers at each other and say it's not me, it's the ID, let us have our own plan in the department in terms of making sure that we service the hospitals, clinics that are there in terms of our infrastructure that has been old, some of it. So we do have that plan and we're working on it now. That's why Raima Musa is part of those hospitals that we are prioritizing out of the 10 that we said to Minister, we need assistance. And Minister is helping us again two weeks back. He had a report that he wanted from us in the province and he highlighted again the need of pumping more resources when it comes to infrastructure, that will be managed again properly because there's something else of bringing resources and then you don't manage those resources. Hence, we'll be working <coughs> jointly with the national office when it comes to that one off. Because what was happening in the hospitals, we're not even maintaining some of the minor maintenance problems. They were not done by us, they were done by DID. You see a bulb uh, hanging, then a person pass and say, it's not me. It's DID. Then the DID will go and do the quotations that will take three to four months. Then that process again, it takes. That's when we said, now, I am not going to do that. You are going to make sure that we do our own minor infrastructure in all the hospitals. And that's the decision we've taken. And I think so far now it's yielding results. I'm sure last week we have seen the work that we have done towards, that we have done on our own as the provincial government. At, uh, in fact, Department of Health at Tembisa hospital for that overflow that everybody has been talking about which we know because we went there clean it and make sure that now at least let's do the overflow so that people don't find them sitting on the chairs because they don't have space it's still not enough but we're working on that so we've identified all of them and we are going to implement them minister 
and chair. And the other one is the one that talks to the financial account accountability. We have tightened some controls in the department. I know some of you have some tenders in the department. I'm no longer famous with you because there is a certain period, Minister, that we have said we are watching the trend in the department that was happening that people, uh, Chair, will submit their invoices. Now it's come, May, April is coming. Already the financial year ended in our department in October. That's what's happening when it comes to the coffers. We don't have money because it has been finished. Then they will do some work and then claim for that work, wait for April and then submit their invoices. Then they pay them. So when it comes to October, November, already there's no money in the department. So we've cut that, we've tightened it and said everything which is a cool irregular expenditure. These are the lines and they are accounting to us. CEOs and finance managers are accounting to us on monthly basis now, which is something that was not done before. It has been difficult on the first month because everyone was jumping that who is this MEC that says now we must come with CEOs and account because some of the CEOs are not even knowing the budget of the hospitals, the expenditure that is being done there. Let alone, Minister, that there is another way because we're working with the Department of Finance on terms of property auditors and on the bigger tenders, then they will delay in buying machines that are expected because now there is this other person that must do the work for us when we do the requisitions. So all those things, the management, we have changed everything. We are doing now things in-house, we are putting up controls, but we are bringing in the national so that each and everything we are counted national so that they must know what is it that we are not doing correctly as a province, which we have not been doing. Then the new CEO, we have been in the plan of having a new CEO at Raima Musa, but even the person that is acting now, with the two months that he has been there, there is improvement in the hospital. Some of the things that appeared in the report, they, they are addressing them, including the one of the blood bank. We are addressing it so that it is corrected. Um, we are stabilizing it, Minister. I will leave it to Minister to come and speak to some of the issues, but we want everyone to assist us to take interest of hospitals where you live, including the clinics, especially in this province. Make sure that you assist us, you become our eyes and ears on the ground to ensure that all of us, we change the, the status of public sector in our province, especially the health department. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, MSC. Uh, uh, indeed, the question as to whether as a national uh, ministry and the department we will be playing a supervisory role the answer is yes as the MEC has indicated we have that constitutional responsibility uh, to uh, account and also um, guide and, and supervise the provision of services uh, coordination and, and work with the colleagues in the provinces uh, we've been working quite closely uh, with all the provinces, but uh, because Gauteng is special, as uh, Prof. Has said, is special uh, in many ways. Uh, not only is one quarter of the South Africans uh, here in Gauteng currently, out of the 60 million or so, as we said, 16 million South Africans are here in this small geographic province. Um, <coughs> in terms of the economy of the country, it's the most important with uh, most of the economy. 30, uh, uh, professor here said 33% of the GDP is here in Gauteng. From our side as health, uh, it's absolutely very important because uh, uh, in the provision of specialized services, this is the only province which hosts uh, four of what we call central hospitals uh, out, of, I mean, out of 10. Ten central hospitals, four are in this one province. Uh, these are also teaching hospitals as well. They are attached to medical schools. Two of them are attached to Vets Medical School. That's uh, Chris Barra and Charlotte McLeke. And then uh, you have uh, across the road here, Steve Pico, uh, which is the teaching hospital for University of Pretoria Medical School. George Mukari, further north, uh, as a teaching hospital for... Uh, the Sfako Mahatu uh, Health Sciences University. So, and, and providing specialized services in those central hospitals 
not only for the residents of Gauteng, the rest of the country, uh, about directly, I would say, uh, our province, myself and the prof here from Limpopo, we depend a lot on uh, the services of these four hospitals here, especially George Mukari and Smith Pico. Pumalanga depends on that, Northwest depends on that, uh, Free State has got the central hospital, but they have limited uh, capacity, sometimes they also bring patients here, even Northern Cape. So uh, the rest of the country depends a lot on this province. So we have said to uh, the team, the Premier and the MEC that we, we, we will be working with you, we will be watching you, uh, and because if Houting doesn't work, and when you have all these challenges, it just destabilizes the rest of the country. So it's, it's for that reason that uh, we have a very specific interest in making sure that Houting uh, uh, works. So uh, again, um, we'll be following up the details in terms of specifically uh, the Rahima Musa uh, recommendations, uh, but also uh, both in the, in the infrastructure with our team, you know, in all the hospitals, if you talk to our infrastructure head, uh, he also knows in and out of how the hospitals, if, if you wake him up at night, he'll tell you uh, this is the pro challenge in this one, in this one, uh, so many. I can't remember the number, I think it's 30 something. Yeah, so he will tell you each one what is the challenge and because we also, uh, both technically and financially, we have to work with, with the provinces because uh, with, with the, the challenges of, of financing, uh, we have a cushion in the sense that Treasury does allocate to us, for instance, on infrastructure and also in terms of uh, some of the equipment, specialized equipment, we have a number of grants uh, because the difficulty sometimes when the provinces are under pressure um, the chair of uh, OHSC being a former CEO of Steve Bigo will tell you part of the problem which happens uh, with the, uh, the provinces face is that uh, the very pressure which we are under now to pay 10% increase let's, uh, let's suppose public service and bargaining council uh, agrees on the 10% what is going to happen? Uh, the decision will be provinces we have agreed to a 10% find it in your budget. And then what happens to the hospitals? They get instructed, your staff has now got 10%, but your allocation remains like last year. So what happens? A lot of the money then goes to the salaries. Uh, and then it crowds out maintenance, crowds out equipment. So one of the things which at least we provide a cushion in, with some of this grant infrastructure, tertiary services grants and so on both a little bit i mean on infrastructure on equipment and also sometimes also supplementing even on specialized human resources so for those reasons uh, we we really talking very practical things when we say that uh, even with the rahima musa as a, a major provider of specialized services and also trading because there are a lot of uh, undergraduate training and also postgraduate training which is also happening there. So we have a lot of interest in uh, uh, making sure that the recommendations uh, which have been made by the Ombuds are definitely implemented. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'm now going to take um, the questions from the visual platform. Uh, Tagalani, if you can uh, uh, read those um, questions for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. We only have uh, one question from uh, Tamar Khan from Business Day. And the question is directed to Prof. Mahoye. The question is given that uh, the investigation found the hospital was unsafe and unclean. If you find any direct evidence uh, that the conditions in the hospital caused the harm, a specific uh, pregnant women and all their babies and if so uh, please elaborate thanks okay thank you Tagalan. uh colleagues uh, let me take um, uh, last round from the floor then we'll, i'll afford them in the panel to, to respond it's the last one i promise your first second it's all those two yeah 
three. Yeah, then we're done. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify the issue around the strike, um, the strike action that's been, um, in, that's been halted eventually by the court. Um, I want to know um, how long the military service will be deployed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, how long will the military service be deployed? Um, is the death toll still sitting at four? Um, and just an overall assessment of the heart and hospitals in general. Um, I mean, I think it's quite shocking that the Ombudsman says that in a province that's so well resourced, it's the only one that seems to have an issue when it comes to um, management of the hospitals and particular CEOs. So I, I would just like to get your reaction in terms of um, what kind of movement you want to see or changes being done um, to improve the state of the hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Co colleagues, uh, maybe before you can pose your question, let, let us be brief uh, on our questions. Uh, please, colleagues. You are second, the last, and then we're done with the questions. Maybe take water help in the service. This is the first round question where I'm asking the ombudsman about clarity around the supply chain management um, problems that you said indicate corruption. Thank you. Thank you. You can come in. The last one. It's a poor on the paper. I think this question has been answered, but I'll just ask it again just to be sure. So it's to Prof. Mahoba. Uh, who needs to do what uh, with uh, this report? Like, uh, who's going to monitor that the recommendations are implemented? Are you going to do it yourself? So I don't want to understand it. And then for the health MEC, um, now that the report is out, uh, what is the next step that must be followed? So as we leave here, so what's going to happen now that the report is out? And finally, um, how many negligence lawsuits does the Okay, now thank you. Yeah, the problem will, will be first and then followed by MEC and then Thank you. Can, can, can this person who asked before you just repeat her question? I think somebody asked something that it was the first question that she wanted to me to answer. Okay, yeah. Basically, uh, what I'm sorry I didn't answer it in the first uh, round. What we, the information and the evidence we gathered was that uh, people at Rahima uh, Musa Hospital would place orders and these orders would be sent to the, to the CEO to sign and there would be some delay or the CEO would find that there are things that have not been properly com completed and there are sort of uh, not proper assessment of, of the applications and she would send them back and then they would go back and then they would wait for the CEO to be on leave or to be away from the hospital and then go to somebody who doesn't know the proper procedures and say this is urgent you know we've been at this thing for a long time and get her get whoever is in place to sign and and lots of mistakes are made in that process because you're not part of it it's just one element one element of that now this gentleman who asked uh, do you remember Muhammad Ali <laughs> he once said you fly like a butterfly and sting like a bee I told you my role is just to sting and let the butterflies look after everything I don't I don't look after and monitor my work according to the law the report goes to uh, Dr. Mdaweni and she has to monitor the implementation of the recommendations that are made and she will do that jointly I think with the MEC and the Department of Health. That's how it's done. Thank you.
Mine needs what must be done is the implementation of the report. So I'll have to come up with a plan working with HPSC now because they are involved and I report it to the minister after that. And I will give ourselves, well, they are going, we are going to sit down, indicate what are the time frames, but already some of the work is being done. It's just to make sure that we finalize what we have started uh, in terms of implementation, submit it then to the relevant stakeholders that are here that, that are going to make sure that those recommendations we do implement them. On the stats at Raima Musa, I think we don't, we can't answer that question now because we'll have to go back and check what is it because we have a, a number of hospitals remember so we don't just have stats and um, of each and every hospital and we want to give you the relevant answer i can give you mutala tala's number so that we can communicate in fact taking is here you can send that letter that's taking it the back and mutala tala is here you've seen you so he will give you the stats i'll definitely make sure that you get the stats today because i think you need them today thank you those were the two Um, well, I can see uh, Slinda is taking advantage of my slip of the tongue <laughs> for mentioning about the strike in passing. <laughs> and she's making it a major issue. Well, um, <clears throat> the South African Military Health Services, as uh, I've said on a number of occasions, they really uh, came at our request to assist very specifically with uh, uh, health care and even the specifically nursing care because we were uh, a number of hospitals were struggling and we were very deliberate only when the uh, uh, situation is, is really quite uh, precarious as it was the case initially at the uh, Tsepon Clerkstop and then uh, later on uh, we asked them once that was stabilized uh, to come over to Houten help us at the Tele Mukharane, Sebukeng, and any other. At some stage, we're also looking at Begim Langeni, but uh, during the course of time, as we're monitoring, it was uh, indicated that there's improvement. So uh, the military health services <coughs> um, are only there really at our request. Uh, I'm quite certain that, um, I mean, the report which I got uh, before coming here, before the starting even in my first meeting earlier, was a, a very encouraging uh, report in terms of the return to work. So once we are assured that things are stable uh, as early as end of today, uh, possibly at the very latest by tomorrow morning, all that it takes is for me to give a call to my colleague, uh, Minister of Defence, thank uh, to thank the Surgeon General and his team, and then they will withdraw from 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 where they've been helping us. So uh, I'm, I, I'm quite certain that, you know, uh, by f uh, late this afternoon, we'll have a clear picture and uh, we'll start communicating with the possibility that uh, the team, uh, I think now they'll just help to clean up things, hand over where they've already been taking care of patients, hand over to the rightful people, and then they'll leave. I expect that uh, possibly by late tomorrow. Uh, where they are still, they will be, they will be on their trucks, you know, going back to military hospitals and also to their barracks. Um, in terms of uh, patients who have succumbed during this period, we mentioned the four as from the initial report. We got further reports that uh, there are possibly more, but we are monitoring daily. Now that the strike, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, uh, that it's it's over. Um, we, we will be from the HOD and the HODs or provinces, follow, they'll be following up with the clinicians, reconciling the numbers, um, because, uh, you know, um, you, you hear there, there's a hunger in, in the country for accountability. Uh, people are hungry for saying, you know, uh, there's just too much lawlessness, lawlessness in our country. And part of what we have allowed, even in the health sector, it's, it's a sense of lawlessness where people can do anything and, and just pass the blame. So how do we, you know, uh, 
how do we make sure that even at the local individual level where there can be you know a, a linkage between people who lost their lives and, and the fact that staff were forcefully in some cases pulled out of their workplaces that those who did that when something and then happens subsequently those who have done that must take accountability so those are the things which is really i think for ourselves uh, together with the deputy minister and the MECs, with a lot of uh, expectation by many south africans on our shoulders to say can this stop that there must be some accountability so so we're, we're doing that we're telling we're getting information clinical information and as as you know as that gets reconciled we'll be able to give uh, feedback to to south africans the question of uh, uh, the point which uh, 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 prof mahova mentioned about uh, weakness of ceo selection in routing and you ask why what is the problem in terms of the uh, capacity here in routing well it, in summary i would say it's a reflection of some uh, objective weaknesses uh, there are subjective factors like uh, migration which keep gives pressure on the province budget constraints and so on but there's also objective problems objective weaknesses which we have discussed frankly with the province i mean uh, this is the only province where in this term of the sixth administration mc komarale uh, hoko uh, is the fourth mc in four years uh, you will find that only in haute um, she is the fourth in four years and uh, the acting hod um, you know uh, sometimes when this thing happens they say oh haute is like uh, the oscars which uh, what prof was talking about uh, is very close to hollywood where you go to hod acting cfo acting manager of clinical services acting and and when you trace it backwards as well i think when we counted the other time over the last uh, let me say uh, uh, from democracy i think counting also has the highest number i mean if you have four including those who are acting in the last four years if you go further you find that uh, Houting, i think had about 12 mecs when other provinces are still on their third or fourth mec if you go to hods they also about 12 13th uh, head of department when others are at maybe number four number five uh, in many provinces even uh, uh, some mecs have done two terms in the health you know um i mean one of the clearing examples which i can just say uh, it's not necessarily the only explanation uh, there were no strikes in limpopo for the last whole week uh, the mbc there has been in office uh, she's now possibly finishing a second term she's almost uh, at least 10 years now she'll be 10 years in office now there's there's no you can't say there's no correlation uh, in terms of stability of, of of understanding the sector and 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 being able to manage things and anticipate she's been in it i mean even when we had our meeting she was she, i've seen this they've already done the no work no pay immediately when there were previous disturbances they have the experience they know how what doesn't work if you uh, for instance you are saying if you delegate it to hospital managers they are going to be intimidated so you take it centrally you get the reports centralized deduct and that's how i'll just give you secrets of uh, our own meetings <laughs> but it's just an example to say so these things uh, what you what the prof is pointing out here if there is total instability right at the top from political leadership administrative leadership it goes right down to facilities so that's that's that, that's the answer so we need to work on that and make sure that uh, the stability and you know so that uh, uh, people know this can be done this can be done these are the criteria and then you don't have a situation where tomorrow because uh, you know you know officials uh, government officials uh, you know they know how to play uh, as uh, the political they tell you uh, and it's 
you found out here. Mm -hmm. So you can come with your instructions and so on. Now, it's, it's, uh, it, it, they, they talk about that because you're going to have elections, but mm -hmm. if you have a situation where they know every six months there's a new boss, mm -hmm. uh, then you're not going to get anything happening. So even in terms of appointments, mm -hmm. you will find situations where people who are not qualified you know, uh, end up being appointed. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think I forgot to answer Tamara Khan's question about uh, about the uh, dirty and safe hospital. I did mention that uh, staff members, doctors and others have been marked in that hospital because of basically the way uh, the security system is there, but just the, the environment around it is such that when you get the you get you get frightened a little bit and uh, you, you you get onto your wits but in terms of the hospital itself uh, can you imagine uh, young women uh, or even just pregnant women coming out of theater or having delivered and having to sit with stitches on a chair and the amount of pain they go through that and then they've got to sleep on the floor in those kind of pain some have had cesarean sections and so forth and i've indicated that i think uh, with the usage of that concoction that i mentioned there were 12 documented you know post-operative infections that took place there uh, and nosocomial infections obviously survive and thrive in a very filthy environment so i think one has to take those as a uh, part of the evidence to show that there was harm to patients in that environment that is actually quite dirty and filthy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, the, our panel and our principals, for answering to those questions. Colleagues, on that note, uh, we have uh, now come to an end of our media briefings. We have a copy of the report, uh, which is here, uh, including the annex chair. And also the report is also available on the website. And those that uh, were streaming on, on the visual platforms, we've also shared I mean, copy of the report. Uh, thanks uh, once more for coming. The briefings officially agent. Thank you so much. I've taken we've taken pictures already. If you did you missed it.